Praise the Lord. This is New Life Experience located at 5708 Howard Foss Drive in the beautiful city of Savannah, Georgia, where our founder and pastor is District Elder John Philip Anderson and our First Lady is First Lady Sister Sally Anderson. We would like to take this time to invite you out to our weekly order of services, which begin on Sunday mornings beginning at 11.30 a.m. in Sunday school, 12.30 p.m. morning worship. On Tuesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on Facebook Live, you will be just in time to join us for our Bible class taught by our pastor, District Elder John Philip Anderson, or one of our faithful ministers. And on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock p.m., there is a call in prayer that takes place, and I'm pretty sure you will find the information concerning that prayer during our morning service. There's a number that you're going to call, log in. If you have a prayer request, give us your prayer request. We will be so happy to pray for you. And we will also be happy to receive a praise report once God has done the work. So on this day, this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. And guess what? It is Sunday school time. So we're going to go into our Sunday school lesson on today. And our Sunday school lesson for today is Jesus Heals a Centurion Servant. Now, once again, we've gone back to our Gospel Union Press Sunday School book, and we're going to follow it, uh, the quarterly, um, let's say, schedule of lessons that we have. Um, so today, Ju Jesus, excuse me, heals the centurion. So let us pray at this time, Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you, O oh God, for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for who you are and for all that you have done. Lord God, I ask you to open up our understandings, O oh God, that we may behold great things from your law. And Lord God, I ask you once again, Lord, let the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength, my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So once again, the title of our lesson is Jesus Heals the Centurion Servant. And our lesson is going to come from the book of St. Luke, chapter 7. And we're going to begin reading from verses 1 to 10. And as our manner is, we will read through our scripture, give some history, talk about what's going on in that present day, and talk about how we can relate it to us right now. Amen. So let's go to St. Luke, chapter 7, beginning at verse number 1. And it says, Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a centurion's, a certain, excuse me, centurion's servant who was there unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard the, of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that, he was worthy of whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Wherefore, Neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. Amen, amen. That was from our King James Version. And I'm going to pull out a few things from our complete study, uh, Jewish study Bible that could, I guess, I believe it's going to help enhance what we just read. And the same verses said, when Jesus had finished speaking to the people, he went back to Capernaum. Now, let's go into some background. Jesus went back to Capernaum. Now, preceding chapter 7, we're going to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, it said, and in chapter 6, we know what Jesus was doing right before this particular event happened. So chapter 6, we find where Jesus had a litany 
of um, teachings that he had taught the people. Now, the significance, number one, of Capernaum was, as I was studying to find, Capernaum was actually Jesus' home base of ministry. Now, we know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. When he was a young child, Mary and Joseph moved to Nazareth. But he grew up in Nazareth, and the last time we hear about him, uh, well, not the last time, but one of the major events we hear about him in Nazareth was, number one, when he was 12 years old in the temple, where they went to Jerusalem, they came back to Nazareth. But in Luke, the fourth chapter, I believe, we see a scripture where Jesus was in the synagogue, and Jesus opened to a certain scripture that was in Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to, you know, and that's what, uh, uh, Luke 4 and 18 and 19. And he says what the Lord has anointed him to do. Now, in verse number 19, Jesus said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And you can look that up and you can see the reaction of the people when Jesus made that statement. They tried to kill him. Okay? So, when Jesus made that statement, they tried to drag Jesus out of the city, throw him off the brow of a hill, but he escaped from them. And from what history states, at this point or after this event was when Jesus actually moved his ministry into Capernaum. Okay? So Jesus moved his ministry into Capernaum, and Capernaum was a very prime spot because Capernaum was not a huge city. From what I read, it was about 1,500 people lived in Capernaum. There were two synagogues in Capernaum, which was pretty good for that time. And, you know, the size of that city, they have two synagogues. So there was two synagogues in Capernaum. So that was really a very good um, area for Jesus, uh, for Jesus's home base of ministry to be in Capernaum. Jesus uh, did many miracles in Capernaum because guess what? In Nazareth, the people did not receive him. Is there evidence of that in Scripture? Yes, there is. Remember Jesus made a uh, statement that a prophet is without honor in his own, you know, you know, among his own kinsmen in his own country. At this point, Jesus was still living in, I believe, Nazareth when he made that statement. But the people in Nazareth did not accept it because they felt as though, okay, well, Jesus, we know you. We know who your mama is. We know who your daddy is. And um, why are you coming with, you know, with, uh, it was hard for them to accept to accept who Jesus was. He moved to Capernaum. People were more open. But then they were kind of shallow and closed-minded also. But it was a great place to begin his ministry. Now, in the book, uh, in the sixth chapter of Luke, we see a lot of the teachings that Jesus um, did. And let's uh, recap a few of them. He taught them about, in the sixth chapter, uh, we see where uh, the Beatitudes was there. No. Be a blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom. Yeah, that's in 6, verses 20, verse number 20. Um, we see where he taught them to um, the way of love, beginning at verse number 27. We see where he taught them about not judging other people, beginning in verse number 37. We see where he taught them that a uh, disciple is not above his Lord. That's in verse number 40. Um, and it's amazing. We also see where um, he talked about you heard Moses said this, or so-and-so was said under the law, but I say unto you, in other words, I'm bringing you a new and a better way, that you heard uh, it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, okay? But Jesus said, but I say unto you. So Jesus, we see where he's making that transition, teaching them not so much um, the law of retribution, but the law of love, okay? So he's teaching these people things that some, Jews kind of had a problem with because they were so used to what they had already been taught. Talked about the wise and the, fool, and the foolish builders. Now, so when Jesus had ended all these sayings, that's verse number one, so that brings us up to where we are, verse number one. But he ended all of these sayings in the ears of the people. He entered into Capernaum and a certain centurion servant. Now, what is a centurion? According to the complete Jewish study Bible, a Roman army officer. So this man was not a Jew. This man was a Gentile. He was a Roman. A Roman army officer. Centurions were Romans, okay? Um, there had a servant he highly regarded who was sick to the point of death. And hearing about Jesus, this Roman heard about, think about this. Oh, wow. It makes me think. Jesus said the first shall be last and the last shall be first, okay? Jesus did, at this point, Jesus did not come to the Gentile. He came to the uh, house of the lost sheep of Israel. 
that was who he came to. But it says a certain centurion, he heard about Jesus. So while Jesus are doing all of these miracles and he's basically preaching to the Jews, he's getting a lot of attention. And so this Roman, this centurion, it's his bright idea to send some Jews to Jesus. And, you know, I didn't catch that until this morning when I read this. It was literally the, centuri the centurion's idea. Let's read that. Let me read that again. It says, um, hearing about Jesus, the officer, or that's the centurion, sent some of the Jewish elders to him with the request that he will come and heal his servant. This Gentile man had enough faith and understanding to acknowledge that the answer to his dilemma is Jesus. Have you ever thought about so many times that we, we, we look for answers and don't realize the answer's right there? I know I do it a lot. And it's like we go round and about trying to figure things out when the answer's right there the whole time. Like me looking for my glasses when I have them on. I've done that many times. I'm like, where are my glasses? Oh, I got a bone. Um, and it's kind of like this with the Jews. They're looking for a deliverer, and Jesus is right there. But the centurion was able to see that. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. So, and he sent Jewish, he sent lead, uh, Jewish leaders to him to request that he should come and heal his servant. They, and the Jewish leaders did it. They came to Jesus and pleaded with him earnestly. Now, what? is amazing about this. These people that came to Jesus probably didn't even believe in him themselves. Because remember, he came unto his own and his own received him not. So these were people that because they knew this, because they knew the centurion loved their nation and they may have had no particular love for Jesus, but the centurion knew that Jesus had the answer to his problem. He asked these men to go to Jesus. But I don't know, maybe they did believe, I don't know. But he asked these men to go to Jesus and ask Jesus to come and heal his servant. And they went. Now, think about this. This is what they said to Jesus in verse number four. King James says, and they besought him. Wait a minute. Yeah, instantly, okay, saying that he was worthy of whom he should do this. The Jewish leader says, this man really deserves for you to heal his servant. A little funny is, I see that smile on your face, and it's amazing. You know what, Jesus, we don't believe you, but this, you know, if you're going to do anything for anybody, you need to do it for him. Because he really deserves it. Okay, and then they go on to tell Jesus, this is why he deserves it. In fact, he built us a synagogue. Uh-huh. So Jesus went with them. Many times Jesus, now this is amazing, as strict as the Jews was on protocol, a Jew was not supposed to enter into the house of a Gentile. But they literally went to Jesus and told Jesus, you need to come and heal this man's service. So Jesus, because this man built us a synagogue, we don't care about protocol right now. You just need to go heal this man's service. And this is the reason why. And Jesus broke protocol. He went. One of the problems that a lot of the Jews had with Jesus was he broke protocol so many times. What were some times Jesus broke protocol? Well, this was one. He was going to this Gentile's house. The Syrophoenician woman. Oh, what was the other one? Healing on the set. Break protocol. The Syrophoenician woman. He, and he, he called her. He, 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 he called the lady a dog. It's not meat to give the children's bread to the dogs. He broke protocol. And when the disciples saw it, and I'm talking about now about the um, Syrophoenician woman, the disciples were like, Lord, send her away. She's crying after us. Send they had no compassion for this woman at all. The disciples wasn't all that compassionate when Jesus was around, but boy, did they learn. And, um, and Jesus said, well, it's not meat to give the children's bread to the dogs. And the lady was like, 
hey, I'm a dog, that's fine, but I need, I need you. <laughs> this dog needs you, so at least give me the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She was not offended. Sometimes you can go through so much, and you know somebody got the answer? I don't care what you say. I refuse to be offended. I just need my answer. And that was, and God, and Jesus did it. Now, Jesus was willing to break protocol to go to this centurion's house. But the centurion had an aha moment. What was that aha moment? The centurion said this. Here we go. While Jesus was coming to his house, the officer or the centurion, and we're in verse number six, sent friends who said to him, Sir, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy for you to enter under my roof. So the centurion had, he sent his servants to Jesus, and he thought about this thing. He had a lot of reverence. This centurion had a lot of reverence because the centurion evidently realized he's not even supposed to come under my roof. And so the centurion sent friends to Jesus again and told him, Master, don't trouble yourself. It's okay because I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Wow. But, here's the but, or according to the Jewish study Bible, but he says, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. And then he says, okay, this is what he says. Okay, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. And then he said, this is why I didn't presume to approach you myself. So this is the reason why I didn't come to you myself. I sent your peeps. I sent your people. I sent the Jewish elders because I wasn't, I'm not worthy to approach you myself. That says a lot. I mean, think about this now. The Jews were under Jewish um, captivity. No, that was under Roman. Um, we call it captivity at that time. You have a Roman soldier who is actually over, has been put over the Jewish people because they're supposed to do what he said because he's the law, okay? So you have this Roman soldier who is, you could say, supposed to be like over them who's coming down and lifting Christ up and saying, I'm not worthy to even come to you. The Roman soldiers could do what they want, go where they wanted. But he told Jesus, who was a Jew, who they had dominion over, I'm not worthy that you should even come under my roof. Wow. Instead, just give a command. Wow. That's powerful. I'm, you know, so you know what, Jesus? I exalt you so much. I acknowledge you who you are. Yeah, I acknowledge your power. I acknowledge your authority. I'm not worthy you come under my roof, but all you have to do is speak a word and my servant shall be healed. You know, I have not, all, in all the years, Sister Renee, that I've read this, I have never seen this before. Just the, the humility that this man had and the reverence that he had. I'm not even worthy. Thinking about his position. Naturally, his position was, you know, he's on top. We on top of the world. The Romans be on the world right now. And you are under me. You are my underling. You are a servant nation. But I'm going to condense him and come down and lift you up and say, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. So you just speak the word. Because I understand authority. In other words, he was really telling Jesus, I understand that you are large and in charge of all things. That's really what he was telling him, that I understand that. And, and I've heard it preached this way that I have uh, uh, what, natural authority, and I understand you have spiritual authority. This man would say, no, 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 I understand you got all authority. That's really what he was saying. He wasn't saying, you got the spiritual and I got the natural. He was saying, Lord, you got it all. You are king. You are Lord of the earth and the universe. You are, I mean, you the big kahuta, you it. And he came to that conclusion. He understood that when the Jews, the ones that Jesus was sent to, didn't get it. Whoa, this is blowing my mind. Help me, Lord Jesus. Here we go. Now, so he said, instead, just give the command 
and let my servant recover. In other words, Jesus, you just loose the healing by your word. You just loose the healing with your word. And you allow my servant to recover. Let him recover. Because his recovery is in, ooh, his recovery is in your hands. Whoa, I, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. His recovery is in your hands, Lord. So, God, whatever, ooh, Lord, whatever you allow, let it be. But, Lord, allow him to be healed. And I'm, to me, this is to me, this is saying, God, if he live, it's because you allow it. If he doesn't make it, Lord, it's because you allow it. But bottom line is, Lord, I understand that you're in charge of it all. Okay, now, here we go. And then he says, for I too am a man set on am a man set on authority. I have soldiers under me. I say to this one, go and he goeth, and to another come and he come, and I say to this, uh, and I say um, to my slave, do this, and he does it. So I understand authority. I'm used to giving orders. But Lord, I know you over that. Jesus was astonished. Jesus was surprised. Jesus was mesmerized. Man. Jesus was like, whoa. I think it take a lot to surprise us to have surprised Jesus. Because he knows everything. But he said, Jesus was, a, they visibly saw Jesus' expression like. And when you think about Lord, what is it you don't know? Jesus knew what people was thinking before they even verbalized it. But at this, it said, Jesus was astonished at him when he heard this. And he turned to the crowd following him. And Jesus said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith, have I found such trust. And when the, and the messengers, when they went back, guess what happened? To the officer's house. They found the servant in good health. Whoa. Did Jesus go to the house? Did Jesus even speak the word be healed? Jesus didn't even say be healed. Now that opens a whole nother bag of worms right there. The man said, just speak the word. Jesus is like, I'm going to do you even better. Mm, he's healed. Whoa. Jesus. That, oh, my goodness. I'm excited about that. Um, now, this is awesome. Anybody got anything they want to say? Because I mean, like, I'm like, woo, this is awesome. And you know, I want to be amazed and astonished and astounded at God's word. That's what I want. Because, you know, in the, I, I, sometimes in the church, we lose that awe. And I think that's what Jesus was bringing back. Jesus was like, oh, he got it. And we lose that awe sometimes. And I don't want to lose that awe. I, I want you, when I read the word, see it and go, whoa, this is blowing my mind. Look at my Lord. Go, Jesus, go. I want that. I want that. Because <clears throat> he is awesome. He is, oh, my God, he is awesome. Did anybody have anything they wanted to share? Share, share, share. Okay, so here we go. We've talked about the history. We've talked about what's going on in this day. Now let's talk about what's going on today. How do we take this lesson and how do we apply this to us? Okay. Now, there's another word for faith. We have said it's to believe, but all through the Jewish study Bible, as I look through it, it doesn't use, when it talks about, it doesn't use the word believe for faith. It uses the word trust. So what's the difference between believing and trust? And I see trust is a better word to use for faith than believe. So what's the difference between uh, believing and trust? Okay, and believe is what? Okay, so belief is this. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, and it's like yes, and it's like belief is, I give, I, I, I believe, 
okay? Um, weatherman says it's not going to rain, but I believe it's going to rain, okay? Trust is not only do I believe I'm going to rain, but I'm taking my umbrella too. Belief is I believe that God is able, that Jesus is able to walk on the water. Trust is I'm stepping out, and I stepped out. That's the trust. Belief is I believe in the law of gravity, and I believe Jesus have power over the law. Of, I believe Jesus have the power over the law of gravity. No, I'm not going to use the law of gravity because you know it's going to happen if you step off a three-story building. But oh, let's do this. I believe that He should give His angels. Oh, and this is ooh, mm, 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 okay. I believe, and this is this was the temptation the enemy gave to Jesus. Step off the pinnacle of the, temp, of the temple because the Bible says he shall give his angels charge over thee and they shall lift them up, he, they shall lift thee up in their arms lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Okay, I believe that because that's scripture. It's a, but, but there's a little something that the enemy left out. He will keep thee in all thy ways lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Okay, now I believe that but trust is this. Push come to shove, and I'm not trying to tempt God. P push come to shove. My back is against the wall, and I got to step out. I'm stepping because I believe he's going to hold me up. And I said, not as tempting God, but say in a situation where in kind of like this, in a situation where in say um, you're in a boat, okay? Boat is going down. You don't have a life jacket, Okay? I believe God is going to deliver me. Trust is when I hit that water, I'm going to start flailing some arms or something because I ain't going down. That's true. Belief is I believe I ain't going down. Bloop, 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 bloop. Trust is no, I'm not going down. Faith without works is dead. Trust adds those works to what you believe. Yes, ma'am. And what I'm saying is faith and trust is synonymous. You don't, you, you can't um, divide faith and trust. They're synonymous. You believe, but you also trust. That's faith. It's not one or the other. You lock them in together. That's faith. You believe and you trust. That's faith. And what I was saying is, in, what I noticed was in the complete Jewish study Bible, instead of them always using the word faith, 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 they use the word trust, trust, trust. Because trust was always associated with they were willing to step out. Not just say, I believe it, but the willingness to step out. And they did. Moses going through the Red Sea. I believe God's going to part this Red Sea. But ain't nobody moving. But what did, God, what did Moses tell them? Move forward. It wasn't until they started moving forward that the Red Sea split. It wasn't like it was on Cecil D. DeMille's Ten Commandments where all of a sudden a cloud hit it and bush. It wasn't like that. When we read in um, Exodus, they waited all night long for that Red Sea to split. And when they started moving forward was when it happened. That's trust. He Moses going to kill us and he loses his mind. No, nope. Trust. And the children of Israel had a problem with trust because to them, and even when the children of Israel, remember when they went through the Jordan, going into the promised land? What happened to the Jordan? God dried it up for them to get through it. And it wasn't until the feet of the high priest touched the water that it split. That's trust. Belief is, well, I believe he's going to do the same thing to the Jordan that he did to the Red Sea, but we ain't going nowhere till he do it. So we believe he's going to do it. Trust is, pop, priest, go for it, take that ark and go for it. They started walking. When their foot hit that water, push. Faith, trust, belief. Interwoven, knit together. And so, and Jesus said, what was the centurion's trust level? 
Because the centurion didn't have faith. Yeah. So I'm not knocking the word faith. I'm just showing where faith without works is dead. Your works shows your trust factor. That, that's all I'm saying. Faith is good, but it's, and both of them go together. So what was the centurion's, you, you know? Yeah, what was his trust level? Yeah. So what was his work? Work number one, get to Jesus. Work number two, he sent the, um, the Jews. Work number three, he decided, you know what? It don't even take all that. Lord, just speak a word. Did he believe his servant would be healed? Yeah, because he said, if you speak the word, my servant will be healed. <laughs> so yes, he did believe it. Now, did Jesus speak a word? We don't have that recorded. But was his servant healed? Yes, he was. And I'm like, maybe Jesus was like, I'm going to do you one better. I ain't saying nothing. You believe? It's done. All he had to say was, mm -hmm. yes, that excites me. Okay, so once again, bringing it down to today. Bringing it down to today. Um, and we've talked about how we can trust God. We believe that, um, how trust and belief, go, trust and belief is faith. Trust and belief is faith. Put, put them together. Because um, when, we, when we give the scripture, tell, if you tell a person who doesn't know God, well, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, they're going to go, what? What does that mean? How would you break that down to a person? Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How would you break that down? We just did. Trust him. If you trust him and go for it, you will see the results of what you've been asking for. So in other words, faith is what gives substance or brings substance to what you don't see, to what you don't, what, for what you hoped for but didn't see. Faith is what brings it into reality. Wow. I'm like, ooh, I'm, I'm happy about this. Okay, so moving on. Bringing it back down to day. Let's pick something. That's, we're going to pick another one. Um, got it, got it, got it, got it. You're found in good health. Okay, so that's about what I gleaned from that. And the other thing that I'm looking at is no, 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 no. That's really what I gleaned from that. And that's about as far as I can go right now. So, does anyone have any questions? I, I, I'm just excited about that one, man. Wow. Any questions? Anybody want to add to it? You can. Anybody want to reteach it? We got time. Yeah, we have teachers in this class, a lot of them. Come on, say something, because I'm tapped out. This is the first time I've been tapped out before a lesson was over. Yeah. So this has been New Life Experience, located at 5708 Howard Foss Drive in the beautiful city of Savannah, Georgia, where our founder and pastor is District Elder John Philip Anderson and our first lady sister, Sally Anderson. Once again, we would like to take this time to invite you out to services. Wow, guess what? you have enough time to get here because service begins in approximately 25 minutes. So from wherever you are in Savannah, you can make it on time. But if you're a few minutes late, don't feel bad. Just come on anyway. Amen? Amen. So we hope that you join in again next week, same time, same YouTube station, same Facebook page. Amen? Amen.